I have to say this is my favorite talk to give, um, and you're my favorite audience to give it to. I really enjoy being here every summer. Doesn't hurt to compliment your audience, right? But uh, no, this is, a, this is one of those important issues, product safety regulation. It's one of those things where people are often tempted to think markets just can't work and we need some government intervention. And uh, when I talk to students about this, sometimes I get this, well, maybe it should just be light intervention, but intervention nonetheless. And, um, and so what I'd like to start off with here is uh, Rothbard's, Murray Rothbard's framework for looking at intervention and give you that, um, that, what, okay, did I miss something? Oh, well, that's his word. <laughs> I, I, didn't make that up, but that, that's, uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, Rothbard in, in uh, Power and Market, things, words mean different things in different contexts. So, um, in Power and Market, he says, okay, there's, there's three types of, of intervention, autistic, binary, and triangular. And when he says autistic intervention, he means <laughs> intervention. <laughs> I revised my slides this year. I guess I did a great job, right? Um, where you have an aggressor who is requiring a victim, if you will, to do something, and the aggressor gets nothing in exchange. So homicide would be an example of this. Um, the, the aggressor is, is, um, is, is kind of a one-sided, one-way um, uh, aggression. A binary intervention is where the aggressor does get something in exchange for this. Um, I guess you could argue the autistic intervention uh, the aggressor gets the satisfaction of watching something bad happen to the other person, but um, we, would, we would put taxes uh, or uh, other types of theft in uh, binary intervention in that category. Conscription, uh, the draft, uh, the government says you must show up and you must do this, this thing. Uh, jury duty uh, is, a, is a milder form of this. Um, you, you have to show up and do this thing, so we're going to get this thing from you, and you, you have no choice about whether or not to do it. Triangular intervention, which is where I'm going to spend most of my time here today, involves an interference of this aggressing um, entity with two other entities, uh, requiring that they both behave in a certain way. So uh, if the government imposes a minimum wage law or... Um, imposes certain requirements about labor conditions or product quality, which we'll talk about today, um, that would be triangular intervention. So the, these two parties are making a contract with each other perhaps, but the conditions or the terms of that contract have to be under the, um, the rules or the constraints of, this, of this, um, this other entity. So when it came to product quality regulations, uh, Rothbard said that one of the favorite arguments for licensing laws and other types of quality standards is that governments must protect consumers by ensuring that workers and businesses sell goods and services of the highest quality. Uh, he says the answer, of course, is that quality is a highly elastic and relative term and is decided by the consumers in their free actions in the marketplace. The consumers decide according to their own tastes and interests, and particularly according to the price they wish to pay for the service. There is such a thing as too much quality. There is such a thing as too much safety. I ask students sometimes, is it possible to make a car that is too safe? And most people would say, well, no, I mean, I, more, the more safety, the better, right? Uh, but that's forgetting, of course, that you have to make certain trade-offs. You have to give something up in order to get more safety. You have to um, maybe sacrifice gas mileage, or you have to sacrifice reliability, or performance, or comfort, or um, cost, price. Uh, you can have a safer car, but it's going to cost you more. And complexity. You know, I, I have a vehicle that has some kind of lane-keeping uh, technology, so if I veer over the white line on the highway, then it's going to make my steering wheel shudder and it'll beep at me or something. And um, honestly, most of the time I turn that off um, because I don't really like that feature. Other people love it uh, and, and, and really want more of those kinds of things. But these are the kinds of, of, of trade-offs that people must make all the time. 
And for the government to say, well, we know how much safety you should have is an astoundingly paternalistic way of looking at product features. Now, what you've got here is a, is a picture of a, a Ford Pinto in the middle, the black and white picture there. That's a very famous case. Ford made this vehicle which uh, was involved in several accidents, tragic accidents, in which um, people were rear-ended on the highway and because of the location and, and structure of the fuel tank, this resulted in a catastrophic fire and the, uh, and the occupants of the car were severely injured or killed. And um, so people um, began to say that Ford had sacrificed consumer safety on the altar of profit and that, that Ford had not only um, uh, resulted in these deaths, but had, had done so criminally. And in fact, there was a criminal case that resulted from this uh, Ford Pinto um, situation. Now, I, I think, well, okay, well, at, at some point, you're gonna have, as it turns out, uh, Ford could have made a modification to their Pinto that cost maybe like $11 or $15 or something. And if every Pinto had had that modification, then this kind of accident would have been pr largely prevented. Uh, but I would say, well, how, how, how do you know where to stop with that kind of change? I mean, you could make the, the brakes a little bit bigger, make the tires a little bit wider, make the frame a little bit stronger, and each one of these marginal changes would mean a little bit of additional cost. But there's no clear place to stop with that if you're not being informed by the preferences of consumers in the marketplace. And therefore, uh, if you don't stop, you wind up with a vehicle on the right, which is tremendously expensive, and you probably extremely safe. It's some kind of armored personnel carrier or something. But uh, you, you would be very, very safe. Of course, nobody would really want this because it's expensive and hard to park and probably costs a lot to maintain and all of these other kinds of problems. Um, Rothbard says, safety codes are a common type of quality standard. They prescribe the details of production and outlaw any differences. The free market method of dealing, say with the collapse of a building killing several persons, is to send the owner of the building to jail for manslaughter. But the free market can countenance no arbitrary safety code promulgated in advance of any crime. What Ford did with the case of the Pinto is they, they looked at consumer preferences as far as they could discern them, and they said, well, People want inexpensive cars, at least many people do, and so we need to make a car that's inexpensive. We need to make it um, uh, up to the standards of reliability that people are willing to pay for, and comfort, and speed, and so forth. That, and, and some people are really price sensitive, and they want to maintain, um, uh, you know, they want to keep that budget uh, low. And so in order to do this, we have to make certain compromises, not just to safety, but to other things. I don't think many people were, under the impression that the Pinto was going to be as safe as, let's say, a, a, a larger vehicle with uh, more safety features, even if people didn't completely understand those kinds of things. Insurance companies certainly would understand those, and the problems would be reflected in insurance policies. Uh, Harold Winter is not an Austrian economist, but he's got an interesting analysis of this kind of thing in one of his books. Um, he says, let's suppose a risky job, let's say driving a tanker truck full of gasoline, has a one in 10,000 higher death risk than a risky job, a less risky job. How much would you have to be paid to accept that higher risk and to take that job? If you say, well, I'll have to be paid $500 a year more to drive a tanker truck as opposed to an equivalent job that is not as risky, let's say driving a truck filled with, I don't know, groceries or something. So um, if, if you say $500 a year and you've got 10,000 drivers that make the same kind of, uh, give the same kind of answer, then that means that the value that these workers are placing on a life would be $5 million, okay? So 500 times 10,000. So uh, that's a finite number. People put a finite value on their own lives and we can see this just in the choices that they make. I drive a um, compact car, it's got some safety features, but I certainly could buy something that's safer than the one I do drive, and, and yet I didn't buy a safer vehicle. I chose to spend my money in other ways. Um, I could have bought something safer, but 
Uh, I preferred not to make that kind of trade-off. That's my own personal decision about how much safety I want. And for me, I'm fundamentally making this kind of marginal benefit, marginal cost trade-off for myself. Uh, I've decided how much safety is optimal for me, how much gas mileage, how much comfort, how much performance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I, all of these product characteristics I'm weighing in my mind subject to, subject to my preferences and I'm deciding how much, uh, which, which car best fits those preferences that I have. Now, for government to step into this situation and say, no, 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 you can't choose that dimension for yourself. You have to choose more safety. Then that means that I've got to give on something else. I've got to pay a higher price, or I've got to accept worse gas mileage, or I've got to uh, accept uh, lower performance or something. I've, I've got to make those, those choices that are not optimal from my perspective. Uh, and the government actually makes other regulations that work in the opposite direction. For example, we've had for many, many years in the, in the United States, the corporate average fuel economy regulation, which dictates to auto manufacturers that their average gas mileage has to be at a certain higher level than they otherwise would have chosen, that their customers otherwise would have chosen. And what do car manufacturers do in response to a higher uh, gas mileage requirement. Well, something else has got to give. They've got to make a trade-off. They've got to sacrifice something else. And in the case of fuel economy, this meant that cars were made lighter than they otherwise would have been. Lighter cars, other things being equal, are not as safe. So on the one hand, the government's mandating uh, more safety requirements. On the other hand, the government's um, uh, passing regulations that make cars less safe. There's actually been some work done, some studies that have shown how many people have died or been seriously injured as a result of these fuel economy regulations. Um, if you impose both of these at the same time, you may end up with some kind of, of uh, vehicle that is, that is just a lot more expensive than it otherwise would be. Well, I have to mention the FDA. Um, an older product safety uh, organization originated with Teddy Roosevelt. I, some aspects of Teddy Roosevelt I'm kind of attracted to, but I can't, I, you know, there's a lot of stuff about Teddy Roosevelt that is just terrible. And this is one of his, one of his worst moves was to sign this um, Food and Drug Act um, into law. Uh, what this does is create barriers to entry. It means that it's more difficult to make new drugs because you now have to satisfy these requirements of the FDA that can cost at least many hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars to, um, to, to meet all of these requirements. I, I run into a surprising number of, of, um, of people who have this apparent idea that if the FDA didn't exist, then there would be no drug testing whatsoever, that there would, drug manufacturers would just say, well, here's a new drug, we think it's gonna do something good for you, we don't really care if it does anything bad to you, so here it is, buy it, and uh, we'll make money. Uh, that's, that's silly. I mean, drug manufacturers do care about um, getting sued, which is not a regulation, by the way, that's the courts. Uh, they care about getting sued, they care about their reputation. They care about the fact that if they get a name for making drugs that hurt people, that they're not going to be able to sell drugs in the future. So they care about these kinds of things. Insurance companies are not going to want to uh, support with their reimbursements um, medications that cause more harm than, um, than they help. But this does create barriers to entry. We know that this delays the introduction of new and beneficial drugs. Researchers have estimated that approximately 250,000 people died as a result of extended safety, safety testing mandated by the FDA for beta blockers. Um, George Hitchings, who won the Nobel Prize in Medicine, estimated that 80,000 Americans died as a result of a five-year lag in an antibiotic called Septra. Um, and there, there are international comparisons, particularly with European nations that show that FDA-induced lags and cost result in many deaths. Uh, and it's, it's not just the, the lag per se, but it's also the fact that some drug companies will simply 
not produce some drugs at all because the costs of, of getting over that FDA hurdle are too high. Also, we know that the FDA is like other bureaucracies, subject to being captured by the industry. So the pharmaceutical industry may use the FDA to keep their competition out. And one good example of this uh, is the EpiPen. You may have heard this story from a few years ago. Uh, There's a company that, that bought the patent on uh, the EpiPen and then raised the price um, to a very high level. And everybody said, well, see, this, this is just naked capitalism at work. And I, I have to remind people, you know, there was a patent involved here. I mean, the government gave them a monopoly. What do you expect to happen? Um, if they don't face any competition, and if the uh, competition is kept out by the <clears throat> kept out by the, uh, the the necessity of meeting these very expensive expensive regulations, um, <clears throat> food safety regulation. Now, this is one of those this is one of those areas where you think, well, th this is not all that burdensome, why would we worry too much about requiring that a manufacturer of some processed food puts a note on the label that says that this food contains some ingredient? Uh, why, why, would we, why would we think that that's an over, overreach, governmental overreach? Well, uh, I'll point you to a study from a few, year, a few years ago by Yasuda uh, you can find this in the Independent Review, uh, Food Safety Regulation in the United States. And he looks at several things. One of these is uh, the unpasteurized milk, uh, raw milk. Um, he looked at this and, and found out that, well, you get about the same number of cases of, um, of food poisoning in, in, in states that don't require um, pasteurization as in those states that do require it. And in fact, the states that do require it have um, a smaller percentage of the population. So in fact, the, it, it looks like actually it would be the reverse of what you would expect um, the regulation to accomplish if you're looking at this from the kind of mainstream perspective that pasteurization requirements are making people um, less susceptible to food poisoning. It, it doesn't seem to work that way in practice. Uh, another aspect of this is that the FDA's food safety budget, when it was um, reduced, didn't seem to result in any increase in disease statistics. It doesn't seem to correlate at all. Uh, and then once the uh, FDA had a decline in its border inspection rate of imported food, we saw steady foodborne disease statistics. like. You're enforcing the law less, but nothing happens. What does that tell you about the effectiveness of the law? Uh, studies fail to show that rec restaurants with low inspection scores cause more food poisoning complaints. Maybe because restaurants care so much about their reputation that the uh, government's inspection rating is, is almost irrelevant to them. Um, uh, how many times do you walk into a restaurant and you? You're not looking around to see whether that's an A or a B or a C or whatever. Um, it, it just doesn't seem to seem to be as important as many other things. Uh, also, other studies have shown that there are a crowding out effects because the government requires certain aspects of nutrition and ingredients to be revealed on a food label. This may reduce the amount of information that consumers are able to get from uh, manufacturers otherwise. Uh, there's only so much space on a label. Um, the FDA has monopolized a certain chunk of that label for its own um, purposes. And in fact, a lot of this is actually misleading. Um, if, if the government says you, you have to say something about um, sugar content, for example, it, uh, there's, there's not as, there, there may be other aspects of the ingredients that, that um, people are more interested in that may have more of a, more of a, uh, an impact on, on consumers. Uh, one controversial change in the Food and Drug Administration's regulations, or at least a proposed change, was a mandatory declaration for added sugars content. Well, added sugars 
chemically no different from naturally occurring sugars. They are sugars, after all, and if you add some or if they're already there uh, in, in the product, uh, this, this is not clearly helpful to consumers and, in, in fact, may be um, misleading. In fact, there's, there is the risk of making that information uh, so abundant on a label that people get just, they just don't look at it at all, or they get confused by irrelevant information. Um, and, and this is not to put down the consumers being um, ignorant, it's just that people have limited processing capacity and willingness to read fine print. And so if you require a lot more information, then the, the irrelevant information or the misleading information can crowd out the information that is actually most important to individuals. So we don't really know what the actual free market label of a, of a package of, of, uh, of ramen noodles would look like. Uh, we don't know. I, I would refer you back to um, Pear Bylan's uh, uh, talk on regulation earlier this week where he said, you know, we, we're changing the trajectory anytime, anytime we impose new regulations. And we don't know what that new um, how that, uh, that world would have looked without that regulation. I wanted to mention this very famous recent case, the 737 MAX aircraft produced by Boeing. There were uh, two tragic crashes within a six month period in 2018 and 2019 of this, of this aircraft. And uh, the, you know, Boeing's had other problems since, you know, doors coming off and mid-flight and that sort of thing. And it, I, I thought, well, uh, this, this is tragic. Uh, airplane crashes um, are to some extent going to be inevitable because you can't perfectly reduce these kinds of, of accidents. Um, the only way to not crash is to not fly, ultimately. Um, now, you can do some things to try to reduce that, that occurrence or that, that rate of accidents. And so the FAA uh, is, is supposedly uh, working toward that. And uh, it turns out, however, and that in this case, uh, the FAA actually contributed to these crashes. Uh, the government agency in charge of making sure that aircraft were more safe created the conditions in which aircraft were less safe. Now, this takes a little bit of digging, so just hang on here and follow me for a second. This gets into a little bit of engineering, and I'm not an engineer. I wanted to be at one point, and I found out people were more interested, interesting than, than uh, machinery. But in any case, the FAA sets qualification requirements on pilots. So pilots that qualify on an aircraft of a particular type, by the FAA's definition, don't have to requalify on each variant in that type. So you qualified on a 737, but there are multiple variants of the 737. But once you're qualified on a 737, then you're qualified and don't have to retrain or recertify on subsequent variants if the subsequent variants are close enough to the original. Well, there was a really strong incentive for Boeing then to make sure that they didn't go so far with the changes to the 737 that they resulted in the FAA declaring the new variant a different type. And Boeing knew that airlines did not want to have to spend a lot of money retraining pilots to satisfy the FAA. So they, they had a really strong incentive to make sure that things are close enough to the original that they're not going to trigger that new type. Well, handling characteristics can't change very much if that aircraft is supposed to be considered the same type. Now, the, the big change on the 737 MAX is they're going to put bigger, more efficient engines on that aircraft, and uh, that meant that it's going to handle differently unless they make a few other changes. And so that meant that they, they had to mod use computer programming to modify the handling characteristics so that if the aircraft is, is climbing, it's not going to climb uh, too fast or, or substantive, uh, substantively dif differently from previous versions. 
Uh, the image on the right there is the 737 MAX engine. Uh, the engine on the left is the um, original or the previous variant of the 737. And because of the size of these engines, they had to move them a little bit forward and a little bit upward. This changes the aerodynamics of the aircraft in ways that I confess I don't understand. But they imposed a soft, or Boeing said, well, in order to keep this in the same type class, we've got to use software. And so the software is supposed to push the nose down in a steep climb so that we don't modify the handling characteristics, et cetera. Well, so the FAA reviewed all of this, and they reviewed, you know, 30-page checklist of different things. They're looking at everything from seat belts to, um, the, the, you know, ailerons or something. So they are uh, checking off all of these things to determine whether this is in the same class or same type, and they did not find anything wrong with this uh, software fix that Boeing had, had used. As a result of this, uh, this was classified as the same type. It went out into production, it went into the airlines, and then we had a couple of crashes where this software malfunctioned. Now, you put enough constraints on a manufacturer like this, you say you, you can't change too many things, you can only change this one thing over here, you're going to create an environment in which these kinds of, of errors uh, and accidents are going to happen with greater frequency. Uh, it's hard to know what, what would have happened if Boeing had not been so constrained by the necessity of meeting the FAA's requirements. And sometimes the, the regulations can be become so complex that um, people who are trying to follow them inevitably back into some other problem. Um, no matter what I do, I'm breaking a regulation. I, I can't read the entire manual of regulations, so I'm I'm going to be pushed into other errors. Um, there was, this is from an Amtrak uh, crash that uh, killed uh, uh, two people, injured 30 people, I think, mostly on the train, uh, hit a truck, I think, that was uh, operated by the railroad, and it was on the, uh, on the tracks. And the, the complexity of the regulatory requirements were at fault here. One of the supervisors said that the regulations uh, required managers to over inundate employees with safety concerns to the point where there were so many rules to follow, no matter what the employees did, they were committing safety violations. And the result, he said, was confusion about what safety protocols are essential. So uh, people, again, have limited processing capacity, and that's important to keep in mind, but regulators don't seem to, to think about that very much. You can't just do one thing. Add a regulation and something else is going to have, to have to give. You can end up backing away from one risk into another risk. Now, there, these are really impossible things to estimate, um, but we know that there is some trade-off between the expense and cost of regulation and the life-saving that that money could have gone to in some other way. So if you have a regulation that costs $10 million, then that $10 million might save some lives over here in the area that the regulation is intending to address. But if you had taken that $10 million and used it somewhere else, it might have saved even more lives. Now, again, we, we know we can't really estimate these things with, um, with any certainty at all, but there have been some efforts, and I think that at least we can understand that there may be some trade-off between the lives saved over here because of a regulation and the lives lost somewhere else because of the shifting of resources into that new uh, regulatory um, area. So, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, apparently um, you lose about 1.5 lives somewhere for every life that you save with an OSHA regulation. Um, obviously that's moving in the wrong direction. A uh, very famous uh, formaldehyde standard in manufacturing, 25 to one. You saved one life by reducing formaldehyde exposure, you lost 25 lives because of the expense of that regulation 
that required people to take resources away from something else they were doing that also would have contributed to their safety. So you know, maybe my income is lower because of regulation. Because my income is lower, I now have to drive a less safe car than I otherwise would have. So the regulator is fixated on this one thing over here, the, the workplace safety or the formaldehyde exposure or asbestos or whatever it is. They're not thinking about the fact that because people's incomes are reduced, they're not going to be as safe in some other dimension of their lives. But the regulator doesn't care about that. The regulator's going to be evaluated on how many lives were saved in the workplace, not how many lives were saved overall. Uh, methylmercury regulations, I, I'll say more about that maybe later, but this is um, one, of the, one of the criticisms of the coal-fired power plant industry is that they release mercury into the air. I did a, a, a project some years ago, actually ended up uh, testifying before a congressional subcommittee on the fact that these methylmercury, methylmercury regulations um, can cost more lives than they're saving um, ba depending on what the assumptions are that you're, that you're making about exposure. Um, this is a, a graph that I pulled from uh, a textbook by Kip Viscusi called The Economics of Regulation and Antitrust. And you know, if you're, if you're working for OSHA, you're probably going to say, well, look, since OSHA came into existence in 1970, Look at how much there, how many lives we've saved. Look at how much workplace mortality has fallen. I mean, it was around, what is that, about seven uh, workers per 100,000 in 1970. And 30 years later, it's down around two or less. Look how great OSHA is. What would we do without OSHA? But then if you look at the years prior to OSHA's establishment, then you realize, well, there's something else going on. It's not necessarily OSHA. It doesn't even look like the trend has changed as a result of establishing this regulatory bureaucracy that's supposed to save lives in the, in the workplace. Um, the, the, Viscusi believes there's not been any significant impact at all of, of having uh, OSHA in place. Well, that's kind of straying from product safety into workplace safety, but you get the idea that they're, they're, it's really difficult to um, to, to accomplish what is intended by these regulations. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on uh, something called the lulling effect, where you impose a regulation, you're trying to get a, a product to be safer, and human behavior doesn't stay the same. Uh, human behavior is going to change. So a very famous study done many years ago looking at the impact of these childproof safety caps. Now, I'm old enough to remember when this was not required, uh, you know, the push down and turn that you have to do on these, on the on medication um, containers, which is, you know, harder for a small child to get into. Uh, what this study found out is that, well, parents realize that it is harder for a small child to get into the medication now that it's got this safety device on there. So why should we put the medication out of reach where it's hard for us to get to, why don't we just put it underneath the sink and it's easier for us to get to the, to the medication bottle? And as a result, you now have more children who can get access to the container. A very small fraction of those children will be able to get into the container regardless of the, of the safety device. And so you actually saw an increase in child uh, medication poisonings in the wake of this regulation. Uh, you got more deaths. Uh, more poisonings, at least, as a result of this. Uh, similar study done looking at concussions uh, uh, with, with uh, the advent of, of hockey helmet requirements on, um, on hockey players. And um, you, you get more concussions because people are going to play the game differently when they have more safety equipment on. Um, do you drive your car differently with um, better braking or automatic braking? Am I going to pay as close attention if I've got a car that's got a safety feature that's going to hit the brakes for me if I fail to see the obstruction ahead? Um, the indications are that I will drive differently. I'm not going to be quite as attentive if, if my vehicle is, is doing that for me. And so 
you can add safety features. That does not necessarily mean that you're going to get more safety. Um, in, in fact, one study indicated that pedestrians were hurt, literally, by um, laws that made cars safer for the occupants um, because drivers are going to be less attentive as a result. So perceptions of safety can cause people to behave differently. Uh, gun safe storage laws, one study showed that that uh, resulted in, um, in, in worse outcomes because uh, people will be lulled into a sense of safety. They won't bother to, uh, to say, keep the, keep the firearm out of, out of uh, the hands of, of children. Um, uh, John Locke, uh, famous work on this, this kind of, this area, and Locke views these uh, as dangerous, partly because uh, he, he would say that these, these uh, uh, gun safety laws gave guns a stigma of being hazardous, and that induced some people to avoid having them in their homes, even though the benefits might have exceeded the costs um, in, in terms of being able to deter a, a home invasion or something like that. So uh, regulation can actually communicate something about the hazards of a product and cause people to believe that something is more dangerous than it, than it actually is. Uh, TSA regulation, this is another one of those areas where people would say, well, I, I, don't want, I don't want to be unsafe when I'm flying. Uh, if we didn't have somebody inspecting passengers and cargo before it gets onto an airplane, then, then how would we be protected? Well, I mean, airlines would, of course, want to ensure safety in their own way and would have more of an incentive to respond to the preferences of their passengers. There is an optimal level of safety, and airlines probably have a better chance of, of getting to that point than the TSA. Um, and furthermore, there, 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 were, there, were, there was some research that was done on what happened after TSA regulations went into, into um, were, were enacted, and they found out that it probably killed more people than it saved because uh, TSA regulations added something to the cost of flying, maybe not that much to the to financial cost, although uh, some, uh, but the time cost and the fact that many people don't want to be electronically undressed by strangers. And so uh, some people would say, well, I, I would just prefer to drive instead of flying. Um, you know, add another 15 minutes on, on the boarding part of the flight, or 30 minutes, or however long it takes you to satisfy all these regulations and, and, uh, and, and to go through the security process. And some people will say, well, you know, that's enough to tip me over into driving instead of flying to my destination. If I'm going to LA, I'm going to, I'm going to fly. But if I'm going to uh, some, some place maybe 300 miles away, I might choose to drive. Well, because driving is so much more dangerous per mile than, than flying, this resulted in more deaths on highways, even if it did save some lives in flying. And uh, the, the result was um, a, a surprising, maybe surprising level of, of um, death and injury on highways as a result. Uh, same kind of thing if you've if you, let's say you have a regulation that says that a child flying on an aircraft has to have a separate seat and a child safety seat for that child. Well, now you're requiring the parent to buy a second ticket. That's going to induce the parent to drive instead of fly, at least in some cases. And again, you're putting, putting that child at greater risk on the road than in the air. So what happens if you don't have any of this regulation? Um, you have tort law. Uh, Rothbard mentioned this, as I said earlier in the presentation. Um, you're going to have uh, lawsuits that corporations do not want to be sued. And so they're going to avoid anything that looks like negligence, um, anything that's going to put their customers at risk that, uh, that could, have been, could have been avoided um, by a reasonable application of, of consumer-centered safety preferences. User reviews. Oh, if, if, um, if you look at almost any uh, kind of 
a service like, like Uber, uh, TripAdvisor, these, these various um, eBay, these kinds of things will all have uh, a star rating. Uh, that, that's some assurance of the quality of the product, not just safety, but other kinds of, of aspects of quality. Uh, private certification, underwriters laboratories, look at the back of almost any electronic device, it's gonna have a little symbol there for underwriters laboratories. In order for insurance companies to underwrite the, uh, the product against uh, lawsuits, liability lawsuits, then the product has to go through this rigorous set of, of tests to see that the product is safe enough to insure. Um, various kind of seals of approval or third parties that are going to investigate the products and do the same kind of thing. And of course, I mentioned brand names and reputation as well. And finally, insurance companies have an incentive to monitor manufacturers. They don't want to pay out for lawsuits and they're going to see to it that manufacturers are paying attention to uh, product safety requirements of, of consumers. This is not governmental. It is a, uh, again, a consumer-centered way of looking at product safety and other characteristics. Now, I put together a lot of resources on this. If you want to read some uh, more on this, some of the sources that I used in preparing the presentation, so this will take you to, uh, to my website, and I've got the PDF of all of my slides that are on there, so you can download that if you want to. Thanks very much for your attention, and uh, I'll let you get to dinner.